And well, what a remarkable uh, watershed election uh, where we've just uh, seen and, and, and effectively still experiencing uh, being on a knife edge. It seems, of course, that uh, Joe Biden is almost there. And it's also clear that uh, President Trump uh, generated enormous support. And his election four years ago was no fluke. Uh, enormous turnout, an amazing election, and we're still seeing the aftermath. Well, who do we turn to to provide us with some insights, some explanation of these extraordinary developments, especially as they impact on the Middle East? Well, none other than my very good friend, uh, Dr. Robert Satloff, certainly the most astute, perceptive, level-headed analysis in the United States of, of Middle East and a uh, broad range of Middle East issues. As executive director of the most prestigious Washington Institute for Near East Affairs, uh, Rob has really been at the center of trying to understand what's going on in the Middle East and certainly promoting the interests of the United States and all those countries in the Middle East interested in conflict uh, resolution. He's an author, analyst, uh, commentator, unparalleled in terms of the excellence of what he's got to offer. Uh, he's certainly extremely well respected right across the board uh, on all sides of politics. And I wanna use this opportunity to thank you, Rob, for all the support you and your colleagues at the Washington Institute have given to me personally, but also to AJAC, my colleagues over the years, allowing us to tap into the marvelous material that you pump out uh, on a daily basis in terms of explaining what on earth is going on in the Middle East and how it impacts on all of us. Well, Rob, the floor is yours and thank you once again for sharing your understanding and knowledge with us today. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you, Joel, and everyone uh, connected to AJAC. Um, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to make it down under yet, but uh, at least virtually is, uh, is better than nothing. I'm always, uh, I have to say, Colin, I'm always worried when someone introduces me as the most astute, perceptive, et cetera, observer. What it really means is that I tend to agree with you most of the time. But um, uh, uh, um, in that case, I'm proud to agree with you most of the time. Um, uh, uh, so we're going to talk today. I'm going to say a few words about the election and then talk about its implications for American Middle East policy and events and trends um, in the broader Middle East. Um, Colin um, uh, highlighted uh, uh, the, the headline about where we are, but I think it does, um, uh, it does behoove us to spend a minute to, um, to give due credit to what just happened in the last 24 hours. First, the turnout. This is the biggest turnout um, that Americans have had um, uh, in a century in terms of coming to the polls and voting. Um, uh, 137 million Americans voted. It's an enormous number. Um, 100 million, almost 100 million, voted before the election. Uh, they voted in mail-in, they voted in, uh, in what we have early voting here, they voted by dropping their ballots off, they, 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 they voted absentee ballots. A hundred million people got around the coronavirus in order to vote before the election. And then we had a surprising number of turnout um, yesterday itself in some places. Now, many places the turnout was light because so many people had already voted, but there are some parts of our country where we still had lines, even on election day. Um, no one expected this level of turnout. The polls were totally wrong in our country. Um, I don't know if your polls uh, tend to be uh, accurate uh, in Australia. Um, here, the polls got it wrong four years ago. Um, here, the polls got it wrong again. There was a, um, a general consensus that the national poll in the United States would show uh, that Joe Biden uh, would be victor by between eight and 10%. That certainly did not happen. Um, uh, and it will be a much, much closer vote. Um, uh, two observations again about the vote. One, Joe Biden did much better than Hillary Clinton did, repairing much of the, um, uh, the faults that led to the surprise Clinton defeat four years ago. Um, he was on message. He focused on the upper Midwest. Um, he brought in much larger numbers of, uh, 
uh, of African Americans and Latinos than Clinton did. It was a much more effective vote for, for Biden. By the same token, a much more effective and surprising vote for Donald Trump. Donald Trump got approximately 60 million votes four years ago. He got 66 million votes so far in uh, yesterday's election, which means that there were 6 million Americans who didn't vote for the president four years ago, who looked at the last four years and said, you know what, I like it. And I'm, and I'm gonna vote for the president. That I think surprised lots of people a 10% increase in his vote. He found voters where nobody thought they could be found. It's quite a remarkable um, outcome. I think where we are today um, is um, uh, uh, two conceivable outcomes to this election. One is uh, Joe Biden with a, um, a clearer path to victory combined with narrower majorities in both the House and the Senate. The House, a narrower Democratic majority, the Senate, a narrow Republican majority, or Donald Trump with a, a much more difficult path to victory, but still existing, also with those narrower majorities. Um, Congress will be closer, uh, more divided, uh, more evenly matched between Republicans and Democrats than at any point in recent memory. If Joe Biden does get elected, he will be the first president in more than 100 years to be elected without a majority in the United States Senate. Almost always the Senate follows the, uh, the presidential vote. All right, I think it behooves us to spend a few minutes now. Let's just take the, the, the Biden narrow victory uh, combined with um, uh, the shrinking majorities in the House and the Senate. I think right now that's the more likely outcome. And so let me say a few words about the implication of that outcome. Um, uh, uh, first, what do we expect during the transition period? And then secondly, how is a Biden administration that gets elected uh, with that outcome, narrow victory, smaller majorities, how is it likely to try to translate um, campaign promises vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East into actual policy? Just to remind your audience, Colin, the transition in the United States is rather unusual. Presidents get elected in uh, the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November, and they, um, uh, they get inaugurated 10 weeks later. It'll be January 20th when we have a transition from one president to another, which means that there are um, uh, 10 weeks um, uh, uh, between uh, the election and the inauguration. Uh, it's, for some people, it's quite a long amount of time. Um, uh, it used to be longer uh, up until Roosevelt. It used to be the beginning of March. Uh, then they shortened it by six weeks. Now it's uh, the third week of January. Um, there's a lot to be done during those uh, 10 weeks uh, where one administration is supposedly supposed to um, uh, enable the other to learn what are the important issues that, are, that need to be dealt with urgently. One begins to get one staffing up. Um, uh, 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 those officials that need Senate approval at high levels get named and the process of vetting them gets underway. Those officials that don't need Senate approval, and namely the White House staff, um, begin to get up and running. It's a very important uh, uh, moment uh, and can be a very tense moment uh, at times. You'll remember that four years ago, we had great difficulties between the Obama and Trump teams in the transition. Um, at times, it seemed as though we had two presidents at once. Uh, President Obama tried to pursue certain, uh, uh, for example, certain UN Security Council initiatives, some having to do with the Middle East, some that I think were quite problematic. Um, and President-elect Trump um, uh, empowered his aides to let foreign governments know that he didn't support them. And uh, we had this very odd situation of multiple presidents, a current and a putative um, uh, operating both more or less in the name of the United States. Uh, that uh, You want to try to avoid that at all costs. But what do we expect in the, in the, the, if there is this Biden transition, what do we expect from the Trump administration? Well, I think there are a few things. Um, uh, one is what are other countries likely to do and what is President Trump likely to do? 
Um, uh, I think that we are likely to see an early test from the Iranians um, against um, both the outgoing, which will be a, a test of the outgoing President Trump and uh, um, uh, the support that he will get from the incoming president. Um, uh, a test of Iran, my guess is, will be, we'll see a test of Iran inside Iraq because the natural inclination of Donald Trump is to hasten America's withdrawal um, from key military and other um, uh, commitments in the Middle East. Um, uh, and the Iranians may very well like to see whether they can speed up that process of American withdrawal. We saw them uh, show what is for Iran surprising restraint during our election campaign, uh, not wanting to make themselves um, uh, a key factor in our campaign. And indeed, there was, not, there was almost not a single word about foreign policy in either of the presidential debates or the, uh, the vice presidential debate, um, uh, which I think from the perspective of the Iranians and some of our other um, uh, uh, problematic uh, countries in the region, I think they were quite pleased with that. Uh, but now that we have a different dynamic, I think Iran is going to want to test whether they can hasten the natural process of the Trump administration to diminish America's presence in the Middle East. Um, there was a threat from the Trump administration to close down the American embassy in Baghdad if the Iraqis were not able to stymie further Iranian attacks on American personnel. I would not be surprised if the Iranians tried to take up the cudgel there and see whether they can trigger that sort of American response. I also think we may, we may see the Trump administration make some decisions um, about uh, um, the, uh, uh, the American presence that still exists in both Iraq and northeastern Syria. Um, uh, uh, the, the bureaucracy is keen, the professionals, the military are keen to maintain this presence. It is primarily right now just a small counterterrorism presence, a presence which uh, leverages the ability of other countries to operate. Um, but uh, I wouldn't at all be surprised if President Trump tries to leave office by burnishing his credentials as the leader who brought the boys home. Um, uh, part of this also has to do with a desire by the president to close the file on a number of outstanding hostage situations in the Middle East. And uh, if the price of getting some of those hostages out includes bringing the boys home, then in many respects, that could be a twofer for the president. And I, shouldn't, I don't think we should be totally surprised if he goes down that road. Um, uh, the, I think one of the other things that we might begin to see is a couple of Middle Eastern states begin to uh, set the predicate for a Biden administration, um, uh, whether it's during the transition or the early days of uh, after a President uh, uh, Biden gets inaugurated, we might very well see countries like Saudi Arabia and perhaps Egypt take some preemptive steps which uh, improve the atmosphere for a Biden administration. And here I could see, for example, um, uh, the release of certain um, uh, prisoners that are being held that are the object of human rights concerns in both countries. Um, uh, uh, while there's an effort, has been an effort to secure the release of, um, uh, shall we, in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, the uh, um, uh, women activists um, uh, uh, who were once arrested just in the, in the context of the, of the women's driving campaign and have been kept uh, in jail for the last couple of years. Um, perhaps the, uh, the Saudis are holding them um, uh, uh, to use, to release them in the context of a Biden uh, administration to help improve uh, the context. Because I think those countries, namely uh, America's less democratic Middle Eastern uh, partners, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, some of the Gulf states, perhaps Turkey, may have reason to be concerned about the likely renewed emphasis that a Biden-Harris administration will have on human rights and democracy promotion, but more human rights than democracy promotion as a key feature um, of American Middle East policy. So all that will, could come during the transition, uh, could come in the early days of a Biden um, administration. Now, if we want to uh, look at some of the headlines of 
uh, uh, translating policy into translating uh, uh, um, uh, a campaign promises rather into actual policy. Let me just focus um, on a couple of points and then I'll turn it over to your, um, to your questions. Um, look, the first large point is to underscore that um, for a President Biden, uh, while the Middle East and while most foreign policy issues, um, but the Middle East it may be important, it's not going to be the urgent priority of the president on day one. Let's all remember what is the dominant issue in America today um, and what uh, Joe Biden underscored throughout his campaign. It is his belief and what he tried to project to his voters that it is a lack of presidential leadership that has got America so deeply um, uh, into the pandemic that uh, 220,000 Americans have died and that we've just suffered a record 100,000 new cases in just one day, every day now. So that his focus will be first and foremost on the pandemic, the health side, and the economic side. When it eventually comes to foreign policy, his top focus will be, in his perspective, on renewing America's place in the world, restoring America's role in, in uh, global alliances, um, restoring America's position in uh, the Paris Accords, restoring and strengthening NATO, um, re um, reaffirming the relationships that we have with our traditional democratic allies. He has talked about a, um, a summit of democracies that he hopes to have in the first year to renew in his perspective, to renew America's relationship with, with democracies. Of course, it's important to point out because this was not a Tran a, a transformational election. This was not a blue wave. It'll be very difficult for the president to say that, uh, for a President Biden, that is, to say that Trump's election four years ago was an aberration. It was, it was a major outlying event, but it was nearly confirmed through re-election this time. Um, no, a President Biden will say um, that um, he was elected uh, uh, fairly, squarely, according to the rules of our constitution, and it is his job to reaffirm alliances. Now, when it comes to the Middle East, there are certain priorities. Um, I, I think it is well um, understood that uh, um, the Biden administration will come to office believing that the Trump team did a major um, uh, mistake in withdrawing the United States from the joint uh, comprehensive plan of action, the Iran nuclear deal from 2015. Um, it will argue that this isn't 2015 anymore. We can't just go back as though the last five years haven't have not happened. But if we want to, this is this would be the Trump team, the uh, the Biden team speaking. If we want to stop the Iranians from achieving a nuclear capability, we have to engage with Iran. Um, the, the Biden team will say that the last four years have proven the rationale of that, uh, of that argument, because they will say, for all the pressure that the Trump team has put on Iran, the maximum pressure campaign, um, yes, Iran may be suffering under the pressure, but the Iranians are far closer to achieving a nuclear weapons capability today than they were four years ago. Um, uh, that the fissile material has gone through the roof, that the advances the Iranians have made um, have been substantial, and that our goal is to bring them back into compliance. And so the, the Biden team will make an early offer of what is called compliance for compliance. Should the Iranians return to the limits and the prescriptions of the Iran nuclear deal, then the Biden team would be willing to remove uh, the additional sanctions imposed by President Trump. That's very different than saying on day one, we're unilaterally re removing all the sanctions that have been po put on by, uh, by Trump. I think that what is far more likely is that the approach of, uh, of the Biden team will be to use this changed circumstance to ensure that the Iranians um, come back into compliance at least with where they, were, with where they should be inside the accord. Now, um, I think it's uh, important to note in this regard, if I had to wager, 
My wager is the Iranians say no. Certainly at least uh, for the next several months, uh, because uh, lest we forget, the Iranians have their own election coming up um, uh, um, in mid 2021. Um, and just as it is um, hotly politicized um, to relieve the pressure on Iran, so too in Iran is it hotly politicized to take measures like uh, diminishing one stockpile of highly enriched uranium to satisfy the incoming president of the United States. So I think it's highly unlikely the Iranians are going to do anything on this until their election is cleared up. Um, the political leader who signs off on this will be viewed as a capitulationist um, and I think will suffer um, politically for it. So whatever the Biden team has in mind in outreach to Iran, which they certainly do, um, uh, I think we have to remember that the Iranians get a vote on this. And in my view, the Iranians are highly unlikely to take them up on the offer anytime soon. Um, the second issue, um, Arab-Israeli issues. Um, uh, uh, I think generally uh, the Biden administration appreciates that um, uh, Israel has made a remarkable uh, progress in state-to-state -state relations in the Middle East in the last six months. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the Abraham Accords agreements with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and then the more recent agreement with Sudan. Um, Joe Biden does not view this as, you know, uh, uh, tarred by President Trump and therefore not worthy of pursuing. To, to the contrary, he himself has endorsed and praised um, these agreements. What I think he is likely to do, this is my assessment, what I think he is likely to do is to try to A, build on these agreements, make sure that they are firm uh, and, 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 and broadened, and B, try to use them as a bridge to, uh, uh, to restart a process with the Palestinians. That, uh, that process with the Palestinians has at least two broad elements, one, uh, resuming a U.S. relationship with the Palestinians, which has effectively been suspended for the last three years. We have no um, serious direct contact, um, no, um, no office in Washington, no consulate in Jerusalem, um, et cetera, no assistance programs, no development programs, um, uh, not even um, to the Palestinian Authority, but even uh, um, uh, uh, hospitals in Jerusalem, these sorts of things. I think there'll be an effort to resume these things. Um, um, all that said, I do think it's important to underscore the following. Um, it is impossible for me to imagine that any aide to the president is going to write a memo that goes, dear Mr. President, now is the moment, now is the time for you to invest the prestige of your just elected office in pursuing Israeli-Palestinian peace, that the peace process is ripe for presidential engagement. And if only you were to get involved, we could bring it over the finish line. I think the aide who writes that memo will soon be unemployed. Um, it's just preposterous for me to imagine that that memo makes it to the Oval Office. Um, uh, I think there is quite widespread recognition that Israeli-Palestinian relations right now need uh, bottom-up um, uh, development and some, you know, more higher level discussion. But um, this is precisely why we have secretaries of state, precisely why we have special envoys. This is, I think, uh, highly unlikely to be something that makes its way to the desk of the president. Um, uh, uh, all right, my third, my uh, closing point on this, um, uh, I mentioned it briefly uh, before, uh, the one group of Middle East uh, 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 countries that might be especially concerned by the election of a President Biden is going to be our sort of autocratic um, allies. Um, uh, uh, our, some people call them our friendly tyrants, or a friend of mine is writing a book um, whose title is Our SOBs. Um, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, 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 Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, perhaps the Gulf states, um, countries that, that during the Trump administration essentially had a pass from Washington on issues related to human rights. 
um, democracy promotion, internal issues within their countries, I think they're likely to come in for much greater scrutiny. There is a wing of the Democratic Party which views this as being an essential and uh, long overlooked element of American foreign policy, um, uh, and they will come for more scrutiny. Now, however, uh, here I will just add one word of caution. This is Joe Biden we're talking about. Uh, Joe Biden is not um, Elizabeth Warren. He's not Bernie Sanders. He's not AOC. He is the longtime chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, he's someone who believes in personal relationships. He is someone who counseled against um, uh, turning on Hosni Mubarak uh, 10 years ago during the Arab Spring. He's someone who appreciates the value of, of even leaders who are less than democratic, but who play an important role in American foreign policy in advancing our collective strategic interests. So yes, I think we will have a greater um, uh, emphasis on human rights, um, uh, uh, but I also think that a Biden administration uh, will underscore uh, the personal relationships um, that exist and that uh, the president will want to tend to um, with these leaders. And there will be a certain tension here, but I do believe that wise leaders in the Middle East, if they play their cards intelligently, if they make certain um, uh, reforms, if they take certain measures that are wholly within their power to do, I think we'll be able to find a way to continue a working partnership and a working relationship um, with that administration. And here, I believe that the congressional aspect where smaller um, uh, majorities uh, works in the favor of, uh, uh, of maintaining um, uh, 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 those relationships and of eschewing um, dramatic shifts in, uh, in relationships with those states. Um, all right, I'm going to stop here, Colin. I think I've uh, um, given uh, um, uh, uh, a few headlines worthy of pursuing and uh, certainly happy to, to focus on any, any issues that uh, you and your friends and your colleagues and the listeners would like to focus on. Thank you for that, Rob. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a quick reminder as to how to use the raised hand feature. You can hit the participant tab and at the bottom of the list of participants, there'll be an icon there that says raise hand. We have some hands up. If you are a little bit camera shy, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature. And if time permits, we'll get to them as well. First question, we'll hand over to Aaron Shapiro. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm interested about the, um, the, the going further uh, about the Biden policies on Iran. They've, as you said, it wasn't a major issue, foreign policy in the election. And, and, and Biden has uh, gotten away with, with saying that he, uh, on one hand, he needs a better, he agrees that there needs to be a better deal than what they had in 2015, but he doesn't really, and he said, but on the other hand, he says that he's going to uh, do things differently than Trump and, and, and be much more conciliatory towards Iran. And uh, I, I, be, beyond saying that, that uh, Biden has a plan, what, what do you think he, uh, the Democrats have in mind to do when Iran, if and when Iran says no about renegotiating the deal? And, and the other uh, thing being that, um, how, how, what sort of a better deal if, if, uh, do you think that the Biden's team would have in mind considering that uh, we already know what Trump had in mind, but uh, this, the Democrats are forging their own way. And I, I, I do want to emphasize that, that Biden wasn't part of the Obama Kerry camp to begin with. I understand that, that he was coming from a different place. Uh, so he may have different advisors. I'd love to hear your insights. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So um, the, the phrase, a better deal, is very much associated with the, the, the Trump side. What the Biden people have said is um, uh, they, they have um, essentially a sort of a two-phased approach. One is um, to get back into uh, the Iran nuclear deal via the route of compliance for compliance. If the Iranians comply, then the Americans will comply. By implication, if the Iranians don't comply, then the status quo pretty much stays in place, which is all the additional sanctions that the Trump administration uh, put on Iran. Highly unlikely that we will see a total rollback of uh, the Trump sanctions unilaterally. There may be some symbolic change, but highly unlikely, not least because 
the way the Trump administration imposed these sanctions um, may require um, uh, the sorts of um, uh, declarations by the administration or congressional approval that, that it just aren't going to happen because they're put on, some of them were put under um, uh, uh, some of the terrorism rules that would require um, uh, more than just a, you know, a, um, a, 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 a a decree by by the administration, but so this compliance for compliance, um, and then part two of that would be um, to negotiate with the Iranians um, uh, an expanded agreement that covers ballistic missile uh, technology and that covers um, uh, uh, Iranian subversion um, and uh, nefarious activities around the region. Um, exactly what the administration will use as the leverage to compel the Iranians into that second negotiation, they have not explained. Um, but that's an issue that would only come into play after they achieve success on that first compliance for compliance effort. Now, this I should say is different than what the Trump administration said it wanted to do. The Trump administration said it wanted to negotiate a better deal, um, a better Iran nuclear deal. In fact, there was no effort uh, no real diplomatic effort. Um, uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo seemed almost indifferent or allergic to the idea of wanting to try to engage the Iranians and use the leverage of the additional sanctions to try to get a better deal. Um, his preference seemed to be to wish that the sanctions would trigger some sort of political change inside Iran itself. Uh, but that didn't happen or certainly hasn't happened yet. So uh, the better deal concept is really a Trump concept, um, this two-phase compliance for compliance, and then a second deal, a broader deal, is what the Biden team has in mind. Thank you, Rob. Now I'll hand over to Gareth Naransky from the Australian Jewish News. Yes, uh, hi, Dr. Satloff. I wanted to ask about the uh, peace between Israel and the Palestinians prospects. You mentioned, uh, and as we know, the Biden administration will re-engage America with the Palestinians. Um, what does this mean in terms of how the recent strategy Trump seemed to be pursuing was brokering deals uh, between Israel and the other Arab states, in effect, making the Palestinians feel left behind uh, in the hope this would make them change their positions? Is this, would uh, re America re-engaging with the Palestinians undo all of that? So I don't think so. I don't I see no particular reason why that would be the case. I mean, the United Arab Emirates, uh, 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 for example, took the bold decision to um, uh, reach an agreement with Israel um, uh, to secure from Israel a commitment um, uh, not to proceed with annexation. Uh, but it uh, took that bold decision mostly because of its own uh, national interests, uh, the desire to have a, um, a deep, open, multifaceted relationship um, between the two most dynamic economies um, in the Middle East. I don't think, I don't see why any of that changes. Um, the Trump administration um, uh, helped as the midwife of that, but the real drivers were first and foremost the Emiratis and then secondly, the Israelis. And the opportunity fell to the Americans to you know, dot the I's and cross the T's as it were. But this, this wasn't the American strategy. The American strategy was um, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian plan announced you know, and, uh, by the president with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. And it was as a result of um, that plan that the dynamic you know, was triggered about annexation and the Emiratis realizing that there was an opportunity to use a tactical moment to, to score a strategic um, achievement. So there's no, I, I see no reason why um, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Sudanese or others in the region um, uh, would think that a Biden administration turns off the, you know, is, it, is, it, is an off switch to that process. If I'm Morocco, for example, Maybe this is the moment I've been waiting for. I avoided Donald Trump like the plague for the last four years anyway. Um, uh, maybe I'm waiting for uh, Joe Biden to come to normalize with Israel and hopefully um, restore uh, some very high level um, solid relationships between, between me, Rabat, and Washington in the process. 
So I don't I don't see it at all as a um, as a uh, as a moment where the regional aspect of peacemaking has to uh, has to get turned off. Thanks, Rob. Now I hand over to Ajax Naomi Levine. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to follow up on a point that you made during your presentation about uh, Biden's sort of propensity to revisit some of America's key alliances, particularly with other democracies. And I just wanted to ask you in the Australian context, do you think that will see a strengthening of the relationship between Australia and the US? I mean, under Trump, that relationship has fortunately remained strong. Where do you see it headed? Well, I should say first at the outset, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I should, I'm, maybe a, a bit rare in Washington. I try not to say things about things I don't know anything about. And uh, um, I know that uh, that may deprive me of all sorts of speaking opportunities, but um, uh, I really know very little about uh, the US-Australian um, security relationship. I will only say this, that um, uh, uh, um, Biden and the people around Biden have an appreciation for America's traditional alliances and a desire to invest in those and a belief that those alliances um, are the best way to preserve our interests, um, um, whether it's NATO in Europe, whether it's the, um, the Alliance of the Americas here in the, the Western Hemisphere or with uh, Australia um, and other major allies um, uh, in Asia. Uh, I can only imagine the natural instinct of a President Biden is to deepen the relationship with Australia. Full stop. Good answer. Thanks, Rob. And now I'll hand over to Ajax Fee Fleischer. Hi, good afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Setloff. Um, I want to ask you about the, the fate of the, the Trump administration's Middle East peace plan, uh, the vision for peace in the wake of uh, apparent Biden administration coming in. Um, it's a different model that the Israelis quite liked and the Palestinians didn't than the model that the Obama administration and the Europeans have been pushing, which says 67 borders uh, and that's it, um, or 67 borders is the biases. Um, is there, is that going, is, do you think the Trump administration's uh, slightly different peace plan, which I know Russian Institute didn't like some aspects of, but some aspects of they did like, um, is going to be some serve as a basis for future talks about Israeli Palestinian peace or is it dead with the Trump administration? So uh, here I think um, we now have uh, a long uh, trail of what administrations do when they come to office with uh, plans of their predecessors that seem, shall we say, up in the air. On the table, um, are they um, uh, they're on the table, but where do they go? Well, we now have multiple administrations who come to office and who basically say, you know what? Um, uh, there's a new sheriff in town. Um, uh, uh, and whatever that old, that other guy was talking about, I don't have to, um, I don't have to abide by it. Um, this is what, um, uh, this is what George W. Bush did with Bill Clinton's parameters. This is what uh, Barack Obama did with um, the remnants of uh, the, uh, the Annapolis process of George W. Bush, um, and certainly with the George W. Bush letter to Ariel Sharon about um, um, uh, you know, changing demographics and settlements in the West Bank. Um, uh, this is what Donald Trump did when um, um, uh, he came to office with what uh, he was given to him by Barack Obama. And I suspect that this is what Joe Biden will do with the Trump peace plan, that it will no longer be the, um, uh, the default American position on, uh, um, on Israeli-Palestinian issues. Um, there was an announcement, I mean, the Palestinians have already made their opening gambit. I don't know if, uh, if you saw this, uh, the Palestinians um, uh, said that, uh, you know, in the event of a Biden administration, they'd be very willing to pick up where John Kerry left off um, in 2014, which, uh, you know, is, like, is I, I find a bit laughable. It's as though the last six years didn't happen at all. Um, uh, but, you know, it's not surprising at all. It's, a, it's an opening gambit from the Palestinians to see where the, the Biden people will be. Um, uh, and I don't think they're going to be there either. Um, um, uh, I think Joe Biden is very different than John Kerry and Barack Obama. Um, uh, he has 
a lifelong affinity for the state of Israel. Joe Biden is uh, one of the very few non-Jewish national politicians in the United States to proudly call himself a Zionist, a term that one doesn't hear very much in uh, the public lexicon anymore. Um, uh, he's no fan of the expansion of settlement activity, um, uh, and he will certainly let um, this or any other Israeli government know that. But he's also on record as saying uh, quite clearly that uh, disputes with Israel on issues such as that uh, will not in any way um, uh, 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 be an obstacle to the security relationship that the two countries may have. Um, uh, I think that, uh, that there will be um, uh, um, an effort to begin with to restore some um, um, bilateral relationship with the Palestinians, um, to try to get uh, Israelis and Palestinians to have a more normal working relationship between the Palestinian Authority and Israel in terms of security cooperation, uh, in terms of regular daily affairs. And only after all that begins to, um, uh, to take root is there likely to be a more high level diplomatic and political engagement. Thank you, Rob. Now I'll hand over to Anthony Cohen. Uh, um, You're good to go, Anthony. Right. Um, thank you very much for your advocacy. Um, I find there's a little bit of unrealism about the discussions. Uh, a few days ago, when Joe Biden was introducing his family uh, to the crowd and on TV, he didn't know the difference between his daughter and his son. And he got mixed up between his older daughter and younger daughter. And you're asking a person with this obvious cognitive failure to be negotiating uh, seriously with uh, active dangerous countries like China, North Korea, Iran, Turkey and Russia. And shouldn't we be more focusing on what may be the results of the policies of Camilla Harris? Because it seems rather obvious, it, it just is beyond belief that a person with his cognitive failures is going to be in charge of this arena for very long. Uh, well, all I know is that 69 million Americans uh, voted for, uh, for Joe Biden. Um, uh, uh, maybe that puts him over the top and, and wins him the presidency. We'll find out uh, soon enough. Um, uh, it's certainly a reasonable uh, question to, uh, to ask about uh, um, uh, uh, Kamala Harris's approach and where this fits in. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's one thing. I mean, I, I I can't really accept the premise of the question in the sense that I think that we're going to begin on January twentieth with President Biden, and it's going to be he's going to be president, hopefully for four years. Now, if the premise of the question is that you know uh, by January twenty first we may have a different president, um, uh, then that's one thing. If we have a change after two years, three years, that's something else. Um, uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, if in fact, I think it's, uh, you know, if you want me to try to do a thought experiment and something happens between now and January 20th and where, um, uh, what it would be like with president Harris on day one, I think quite likely that she will, she will pursue the sorts of policies that, that, uh, that Biden would have pursued. Um, uh, there are some objective reasons why. Um, uh, uh, we're not going to have a dramatic change in uh, American foreign policy. If, you, if you're fearing a lurch to the left is, is, is the hidden question you're asking me, a, 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 a hidden, a, you know, fearing a lurch to the left, um, uh, our system doesn't really work that way. It certainly doesn't work that way when we have um, these narrowed majorities in the House and the Senate. Um, it doesn't work that way when we have such a narrow um, electoral victory. Um, uh, it's not the national priority by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I find it very difficult to believe that, uh, that uh, even should this be her sort of inner self, that this is anyway going to get to be manifested um, anytime soon. 
I think what I described as the approach to Iran and as the likely approach to um, you know, our autocratic allies and as the likely approach to Israelis and Palestinians and, and Arab states is basically what we would have on, under almost any democratic uh, president. You know, you, difference of emphasis here and there, but uh, I think it's basically what we would have. Um, we would have a different approach under President Trump, who's already laid out pretty much what he would like to achieve. Um, although I think, you know, should President Trump do pull it out, um, I think you'll get, you'll, you're likely to see in the second term a, um, a real emphasis on uh, trying to get a, um, a new deal, a, uh, what he would call a bigger, better, beautiful deal with Iran. Um, uh, uh, I think that would be a major emphasis of President Trump. And we would get a diminished American military presence in the region um, uh, uh, because I think um, Trump perceives his voters as being m even more animated about bringing the troops home and a, an, a sort of America first-ish uh, approach to foreign policy than, uh, than even if you assume that's part of the more left um, agenda uh, foreign policy. I think um, Trump, I think the President Trump would view that as even more central to what animates his voters than what a Democratic president would believe is central to animating uh, uh, Democratic voters. So, um, I just don't. I just don't buy the uh, the fear of a dramatic leftward surge, um, a leftward tilt, uh, even in the uh, what would be a horrific event of the early um, passing of President Biden. Thank you, Rob. I'll now hand over to Bren Carlil. Uh, thanks, Dr. Setloff and uh, and Joel. Um, look, to a certain extent, you've uh, you've answered my question, but I, I'll get you to sort of reiterate um if biden wins um you know he's obviously he's in charge of a divided nation but he'd be also in charge of a divided democratic party um there won't be a, a sort of a lurch to the left as you say but i could imagine he he would feel like he needs to throw a sop to um to the to the more left members of the party you know aoc and the rest of them um, you know, and, and there might be just an urge to do something. I mean, can you see can you see them pressuring Israel on 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 things? You know, maybe such as settlements, but but on other things, on, on concessions to the Palestinians, unilateral concessions to the Palestinians, just as a stop to the left parts of his party. Or do you think he'll he'll sort of hold the the middle ground? Well, again, I think it's important. Uh, um, to, to recognize where the priorities are. Um, yes, if you go through the, the, uh, the agenda of you know, various left groups or left elements in the party, you will see um, Israel, Palestinians appear. It's definitely an element in you know, how to sh changing, um, you know, rebalancing uh, uh, American uh, approach to, to this issue. But it's nowhere near the top of the list. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's nowhere near the uh, the demand for for uh, uh, racial justice, economic equity, um, uh, uh, climate change activism. Um, uh, I mean, I, those issues are you know far more animating, far more powerful in in bringing out um, the uh, the emotions and the fervor of that wing of the Democratic Party. So if the idea is to, you know, is to address that wing of the party, I would imagine that uh, a President Biden would, would be more likely to, to do it in, in other areas, um, which is not to say that he won't, you know, take a new direction vis-a-vis -vis Israel's relationship with the Palestinians or um, just as he's going to take a new direction on, on um, you know the the uh, the role of human rights as an animating element of American foreign policy, uh, but I, I don't think any of these are going to be the the dominant themes of uh, of a Biden administration or or of its foreign policy uh, uh, writ large. Thank you for that. Now I hand over to Oved Labelle. Thank you, Dr. Zatloff. 
Um, so we've discussed the likely approach to, to Iran by either a Trump or a Biden administration. And I wanted to ask you about Turkey. I know the president's been bizarrely protective of Erdogan. So would you expect the next administration to get tougher with Turkey? And how would you suggest they might do so? Yeah, I do think that uh, um, we're likely to see some uh, rough patch um, in U.S.-Turkish relations um, that uh, President Erdogan is unlikely to have the, uh, you know, the buddy-buddy friend in the Oval Office um, in Joe Biden that he's had with Donald Trump. Um, uh, 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 that, um, uh, and now it's, the Turks have been, have been, uh, uh, you know, very uneven allies over the last several years, to say the least. There are certain areas where the Turks have been helpful. Um, uh, there's certain areas where the Turks have been, you know, terribly problematic. And then there are other areas where the Trump administration has been sort of indifferent, where the Turks have been extremely problematic, where they're trying to expand uh, um, their, their influence, whether it's in uh, northern Lebanon or in uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and, and trying to, uh, um, to steal a march on the Jordanians uh, there. Um, uh, and uh, their support for for Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, so I think that there's going to be, I, I think the Biden administration, the President Biden is unlikely to be, it's a, to see in Erdogan the sort of relationship that President Trump did. Um, uh, uh, the, the, and I wouldn't at all be surprised if Erdogan tries to clean up his act a bit um, as well, because he will realize that he doesn't have the, um, he can't play on the, on the vanities of a um, uh, of an Oval Office occupant, the way he was able to do that uh, with Donald Trump. Um, uh, now, are, if we, it, it will they be um, a real effective NATO partners of ours again? Well, so I think some things have changed, um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the parameters of Turkey's role in that alliance are just fundamentally different today than they were 10 years ago. Um, and this, that doesn't have to do with Donald Trump or, uh, or Joe Biden. That has to do with, with Turkey and Turkey's politics. It has to do with Erdogan, but even more broadly, it's not just Erdogan. Um, uh, uh, now within those parameters, I, I do expect that there will be um, uh, an effort to, uh, uh, to get the Turks to, to be far more constructive to be far less problematic in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, I think we will be fully supportive of, of uh, the French in uh, their face-off with the Turks right now. Um, and uh, I think there'll be much less sufferance for the sorts of uh, games that, er that Erdogan has played in the last few years. Thank you, Rob. Now, final two questions. I'll now hand over to Colin. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for all that, Rob. Terrific, uh, especially that last point on Turkey. I just want to go back to Iran. Do you think uh, Biden administration would inhibit Israel's freedom to act against Iran and, and its proxies and their various nefarious activities, restricting the flow of weapons to Hezbollah and so on? And also, since you know everything and everybody in Washington, what's the tip uh, in terms of who's likely to be Secretary of State for a uh, President Biden? And what sort of leeway would that person have in a Biden administration? Yeah. I was wondering whether you were going to ask me about personnel. Um, so uh, um, uh, your first question about giving um, about the Israelis. My sense is that that the, you know, the Biden administration is going to um, have a very similar approach to the Trump administration on what the Israelis are quietly doing in Western Iraq and Syria uh, in trying to impede the, um, uh, the Iranian um, uh, export of uh, weapons, the Iranian precision missile um, uh, uh, program. Uh, I mean, the Iranians are, uh, the, the Israelis are quietly and effectively um, uh, doing this on a regular basis. The less the Israelis talk about it, the better. Um, the Israelis in the last couple of years 
They've had more of a penchant for talking about things than they traditionally have. Um, uh, I think um, uh, I think a Biden administration will appreciate um, uh, um, you know continued action, less talk would be uh, would be something that they would be okay with. Um, and clearly, like like all these situations, um, they, they it, th th this this understanding would would proceed as long as it is successful. But you know, if, if God forbid. Uh, the Israelis mistakenly hit a school, mistakenly hit a hospital, mistakenly hit a bus. You know, these things have consequences. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, success breeds success, and and problems breed their own their own problems. So, I, but I think that the the inclination will be, this works. We need to have a good, effective security relationship. The Israelis are doing our collective work here. This is in our interests. So, you know, more power to them. Uh, your question about um, personnel. Well, look, there's basically two types of, um, of choices one can make for Secretary of State. Uh, uh, one would be a, uh, a politician um, uh, um, uh, in the mold of, um, you know, a, a, uh, John Kerry, Jim Baker, you know, somebody who is the alter ego of the president or someone who reflects the will of the president because he too, you know, has his own political standing, has, um, has a certain status. Um, uh, 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 there's that route. Um, and then there's the route of a, a highly professional diplomat, um, uh, which is what uh, Bill Clinton had in in, um, in Warren Christopher, for example. Um, uh, um, uh, um, and so that we have both sets of options available. The most likely candidates one talks about, one hears being talked about, um, is, uh, is uh, Senator Chris Coons, um, uh, a Delaware senator from pr the president-elect's own state of Delaware, someone who is very close to um, President-elect Biden served uh, many years in the Foreign Relations Committee, um, someone in whom he has great personal confidence and who would reflect his, the, the president's own um, affinity and interest in all these issues without the president himself playing a role in all those issues. So that's the, that's the senatorial um, candidate. There are others out there, but I think he is the most likely. And then in the other category, um, the professional diplomat, one can imagine uh, um, uh, former deputy secretary of state, Bill Burns. Um, uh, one can imagine um, former deputy secretary of state, Tony Blinken. Um, um, although I imagine that Blinken is more likely going to end up being the president's national security advisor. Um, they have a very close personal relationship. Um, I will just say one other word about personnel. Um, as was noted uh, earlier, um, you know, Joe Biden is not a young man. Um, Joe Biden is uh, going to be our, the oldest person ever to be elected and the oldest person, uh, if he gets elected, and would then be the oldest person ever to serve as president of the United States. I find it highly unlikely that um, the, the innermost circle of Joe Biden will include many new faces. Uh, um, he has a team that has been with him for 30 years, um, in and out of government. Uh, he is familiar with them. He has um, confidence in them. They are likely to be the people who will be around him when it comes to these issues. Um, uh, there may be others, there will certainly be others in the second ring and the third ring. But I think the first ring is almost certainly going to be people that we know have a proven track record of uh, being around him um, uh, and a level of familiarity and a level of confidence um, and a level of no surprises that someone who's his age with his other priorities is going to want to have in those positions. 
Thank you, Rob. We've hit the hour. So now I'll hand over to Ajax Jeremy Jones to ask the final question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Satloff. In the last few days, people uh, have taken their eyes off the US elections to see the terrible terrorist attacks in France and Austria and also obviously in Afghanistan. So a question arises with a new American administration. How well are they prepared to confront the threat of terrorism where it might be, both psychologically, intellectually, and uh, with a feeling that this is a, an important priority for them globally? And related to this is the question of their understanding of something you've written and spoken about over a long period of time, the hearts and minds of the Muslim world. How willing do you think an incoming U.S. administration will be to engage in this battle? You know, it's a very good question. It's something that we're grappling with um, at, uh, at the Washington Institute, and it's something that deserves uh, considerable attention. Um, look, you know, uh, like Australia um, uh, and like many other Western democracies, uh, this is uh, not a new challenge. It is an evolving challenge. It goes through various phases, but this is this is regrettably something that's been, um, uh, you know, in the fabric of, of our, uh, a challenge that's been in the fabric of our politics and our society now for almost a generation. Um, when it comes to the policy aspect of this, I think there is, uh, you know, a couple of uh, quick observations. One, immense humility. Uh, that uh, you know, no secret bullet, no, no, you know, silver bullet to address this. Um, you know, no one's go coming up with the brilliant idea that is going to extinguish the threat from radical Islamist terrorism or terrorism more generally um, uh, anytime soon. Um, uh, point two: that there's a growing recognition, um, and I think some people take this too far, uh, but there's a growing recognition that um, counterterrorism has come to occupy too much of our national security um, uh, debate and our national security resources, especially at the time of um, a growing appreciation for renewed great power competition, um, most notably from China. And that um, you know, counterterrorism needs to be a priority. It needs its appropriate resources but it can't consume everything and shouldn't be the lens through which all of our foreign policy is viewed. Um, uh, some people take this too far and some people have too much of a passive response to this. Um, uh, um, uh, and I think finding the right mix is, is a real challenge. Even among people of you know, well-meaning, good-minded people, it's a real challenge, let alone people who have you know, less uh, high principle and, and direction here. Um, uh, three, uh, I think there will be great deference in a, uh, and, uh, you know, should, should we have a Biden administration, great deference to um, what uh, leaders like uh, President Macron um, are trying to do and say and, and implement in their countries. Um, uh, um, uh, in whatever one thought of, uh, of uh, President Trump, um, I think we're not going to see the sort of public uh, um, criticism of other leaders and of their priorities. And if there are differences, they will be aired quietly. Um, uh, uh, point four, um, uh, look, the, a Biden administration is going to avoid the the uh, the more it's, it's going to just avoid isn't even strong enough. It's going to have a different approach than um, uh, than a Trump administration did on issues from immigration uh, and refugee asylum uh, to uh, um, to how it how it talks about um, Arabs and Muslims, um, which is, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have a um, it, it's going to go down. The wrong path. Quite the contrary. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think there's. I think it may end up in a very good place here. Um, 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 but I think there will be a recognition of the problem you just cited, 
um, uh, exactly where it's going to end up. It's a point of great policy debate right now um, between Republicans and Democrats and among Democrats as well. Thank you, Rob. That's all we have time for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I, on behalf of AJAC, would like to extend our thanks to Dr. Satloff for your time tonight. It was an excellent presentation, very timely, and I'm sure the next couple of days, weeks, and months, we'll be watching very, very closely to see what happens.